Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, happy Valentine's Day. <laughs> and I'm sure people will come in as they come in. Uh, I will be the moderator uh, for this panel. And we have two distinguished guests. One of our, our other third distinguished guests, unfortunately, is uh, ill. So she wasn't able to make it. Uh, so be sure to send her good energy and good health and whatnot. And I will introduce them. Uh, there is a little uh, logistic overlap. So there's a class coming in here at three. Uh, so we're gonna open it up uh, at, by the latest for a general discussion by 2.40. And we may even start earlier than that, depending upon uh, the pithiness of our, our distinguished uh, panelists here. Uh, but uh, let, me, let me introduce them first. Uh, so we have Catherine E. Freeman. She's a PhD candidate in the Department of Gender and Women's Studies at the University of Arizona. She was raised in the rural U.S. Southwest as in de and is dedicated to the production of scholarship that addresses contemporary socioeconomic oppression. Uh, Catherine is currently writing her dissertation, which engages in a critical qualitative examination of the tourism sector in Antigua, Guatemala, or if you prefer Antigua, Guatemala, uh, in order to understand uh, modern security measures and discourses, global capitalism, colonialism, militarization and the complicated power differentials generated by and left in the wake of gender, race, class, ethnicity, sexuality, and nation. Uh, one of Catherine's central career goals is to make sure that her work is strategically useful to the promotion of radical political change, including the abolition of contemporary forms of lethal and global governance. And we also have Carrie Ann Burris uh, Chu. You have to forgive me, I'm a Chicano from South Texas, so we always mess up the SH and the CH, but I'm over that, so. Uh, Carrie is a project coordinator in the University of Arizona's College of Education. Uh, she is the recipient of the Warner Grant Foundation Hunt Postdoctoral Fellowship. And within that capacity, uh, she, more importantly perhaps, she is a, uh, actually no, more importantly. <laughs> she is a member of the Chickasaw Nation and her postdoctoral fellowship will aid research and writing on her dissertation study uh, which is titled, We Will Always Speak Chickasaw, Considering the Vitality and Efficacy of Chickasaw Language Reclamation. And... Um, thank you so much for the introduction, for allowing me to be here today. I'm very excited to be here and to be able to talk about these topics with you all. Um, and within the specific context of the U.S. Southwest, uh, to which I have dedicated um, most of my scholarship at this point and my activist efforts um, to improving people's life chances who live in this area. Uh, I'm not going to speak very long as my goal is actually more to have a conversation with you all about these issues. So I just want to give a brief overview of um, why I'm here and why I'm interested in talking about these topics with you all today. Um, if you are interested in continuing to talk about this subject matter after the conference or um, otherwise in, uh, networking with me, please feel free to drop me an email. Um, I look at uh, opportunities like this as chances to start conversations to continue um, important organizing efforts here in the Southwest. And so um, my email address is right up here, freemank at email.arizona.edu, and I would welcome to hear from you. So um, to begin, I identify, write, and conduct research as an insurgent scholar. Um, so in my work, I do not promote reform strategies or relying upon established policies and procedures like the law uh, to further social justice. Um, in fact, I see these approaches as ultimately furthering the cultural, economic, and historical grasp um, of the settler colonial state, or what I write about as coloniality. In other words, I understand Euro-American world power as responsive, dynamic, and ongoing, as not finished or post anything, um, in part because of its ability to incorporate threats to its consolidation, um, such as those posed by far-left organizing. And I perceive reformist strategies and tactics as one way that these threats are continually incorporated by Euro-American power so that it just keeps re-articulating. So, given this, I am more interested in writing about, researching, and working towards abolishing coloniality and all of its forms and manifestations. Um, and as an insurgent scholar and activist, I try to grapple with the practicalities of such a project, what it might look like and involve, because the first response to anyone who makes this argument is how impossible this work is and how it can never be achieved. 
And so part of what I do is kind of map out, well, this is some of the ways that it can be achieved. Um, I draw primarily from indigenous women of color, feminist, working class, and Latin American scholarship and organizing, or various subjugated knowledges in order to imagine new ways to orient to the world. And prior to my engagement with the U of A, I was a community and labor organizer, and I also served different populations in a social work capacity. So I have firsthand experience with the delicate and careful work that's required for community organizing and community building. And I know that the goals of any organizing drive need to be presented in a, in a tangible and deliberate manner, and that's sort of what I try to do. Um, as a result, in my academic writing and public scholarship, I try to carefully unpack all of the reasons why abolishing coloniality is a necessary, realistic, and achievable project, um, especially in the face of the increasing cultural and environmental devastation, which puts continued survival on this planet in perilous question, and that's exactly sort of what we're facing. So um, I'm a little bit hurt for about this. Um, this is where I grew up. So I grew up in what's currently known as the Four Corners region. And so I write a lot about abolishing coloniality um, in the US Southwest and particularly in the Four Corners. And so I was raised a coal miner's daughter um, in what is now known as Canta, Arizona in Farmington, New Mexico. And um, the Four Corners region is called Four Corners region because it encompasses parts of New Mexico, Utah, um, Arizona, and Colorado. Um, this region is also colloquially known as quote-unquote Indian country, and that's how a lot of the white people who live in these areas talk about it, um, because it lies upon a doc occupied indigenous lands. Many sovereign indigenous nations continue to live here, such as various Diné, Apache, and Ute peoples. Um, so in the Four Corners, the extractive industries and the war machines dominate political economy. So where I grew up, Halliburton has an official office on the main highway coming into town. You drive into town, you see Halliburton on your left. So the stuff I'm talking about here is no joke. Um, in addition to brutally dispossessing indigenous peoples of their lands and livelihoods in this region, uh, these companies are making people sick. So a lot of my friends are dying very young of cancer. I mean, all sorts of strange cancer. Um, a lot of my women friends have breast cancer. I mean, people are just dying and we're all coming out of this region of the country. Um, so these issues are impacting everyone who happens to live here, which are mostly poor, impoverished peoples, right? So poor whites who are working for these companies, um, the indigenous peoples who are already living here and who are relocated there as part of um, the creation of res reservations, um, Latino peoples, etc. Um, in many ways, the folks running these companies were able just to kind of pick up right where the Spanish left off in this region in terms of these established um, socio-corporal regimes of control, right? So they could revitalize white supremacy, heteropatriarchy, and economic cannibalism via what I call in my work the recalibrated civilizing mission, um, or so-called development. So the picture I have here captures um, some of the ongoing consequences of this mission to the point where the government is now offering these like free nursing services uh, for people who were exposed to uranium. Uh, mining on as they were working on the reservation um, and this is right by where I live so and then of course you know you have the Taco Bell sign in the background so um, my stake in these issues is really personal if you if you haven't picked that up so I see writing and publishing as acts of survival as something that might ensure that my friends and family stop dying from environmental genocide in the southwest um, I write against my own extinction and the extinction of all life forms because that is what I believe we are facing. And as Audre Lorde so powerfully stated, poetry is not a luxury. And that's how I feel about insurgent philosophy and theory, which for me is the poetry of resistance. It's not a luxury. So I try to make sure that everything I write can be used in some small way to further irreversible social change, in addition to maybe someday helping me pay the bills, which is probably going to be impossible. So I gravitate more towards the production of public scholarship, venues that are in some way connected to social justice movements in Southern Arizona, the Four Corners area, or abolition work in general. So I try to use this scholarship as a means of leveraging the academy as an instrument for the production of critical insurgent and social theory. Um, I want universities and colleges to be accountable to the various communities they're supposed to serve, especially in the context of the rural Southwest, where higher education is one of the only options for employment or to literally escape 
um, poverty and these death worlds outside of resource extraction and the war machine. So in my mind, if the academy is not held accountable to such communities, it remains a potent and unchallenged site for what Fanon called colonial recognition, for the internalization of the civilizing language, culture, and universe, or your American worldview, uh, your American power is worldview, ideology, and hierarchy. And the reason for this is because the Euro-American Academy was created to materialize colonial recognition, to give it form, to consolidate and sanction white supremacy, heteropatriarchy, and classism as actual indicators of cultural refinement and progress. So I am reminded of another famous quote and caution from Audre Lorde, which is one that is oft recited, the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. Suffice it to say, the relationship between myself and the Academy is fraught, to say the least. Nevertheless, I understand the Academy as a place to produce and disseminate what E. Dussel calls the philosophy of liberation, a counter-hegemonic discourse and praxis where the Academy is intentionally utilized to imagine and enact profound political liberation, which is part of why I can come here today and talk about this, because I was able to access those theoretical tools. And he imagines this in direct partnership with marginalized communities. As Walter Minolo offers, one way to make the academy such a place is by committing relentless epistemic disobedience. To reconfigure what is considered knowledge or truth in an attempt to disrupt colonial recognition and the silencing of marginalized voices. This dis disobedience means seriously engaging and contending with subjugated knowledges and worldviews. An engagement that is also central when it comes to the production of insurgent philosophy and abolition as a political project. After all, um, your American economic and cultural power charted the current course that we now find ourselves on. So epistemic disobedience is rebuking this uh, process of colonial recognition, or what Gloria Anzaldúa calls the colonial wound, in an attempt to transform the academy into a site of sustained protest, interchange, fluidity, possibility, and community organizing. Of course, these debates have been going on for a very long time, and I'm only scratching the very surface of these issues here. But one thing that continues to trouble me is this idea that insurgent scholarship needs to be written in a particular way in order to foster greater comprehension, reach, and mobilization. In regards to my own work, the phrases I most hear um, from publications are, can you make this more accessible to the community, and can you please dumb this down? So I'm troubled by these requests because they assume that a certain subject is, re is reading and producing insurgent philosophy, one that cannot possibly access critical theory because they are from this imagined community where such theory doesn't exist. These requests also presume that insurgent philosophy can only take certain forms, the remedial, the colloquial, the cultural, the creative, or the folk. Insurgent knowledge is supposed to have, foster, or reflect street cred. Subjugated knowledges are effectively resubjugated due to the insistence that these knowledges should take on specific forms, or their subsequent positioning outside the academy and on the street. In other words, these are the politics of colonial recognition as articulated by insurgent scholars and activists. Further, by relegating critical theory to the exclusive realm and purview of the academic, of the counterinsurgent, institutions of higher education likewise remain productive locations for colonial recognition. But, on the other hand, the production of compl complicated and convoluted theory can be an exclusionary and colonizing act, ensuring that only some people can read or produce it, those who attend or conform to your American regimes of knowledge, um, particularly those that determine the parameters of so-called high theory. Indeed, it is precisely because the academy can be such a hostile and alienating place that many insurgent scholars write for and with people outside of its bounds, and in an effort to make sure that their work is relevant and responsive to the long-term goal of global political change. As is probably clear by now, I offer no easy answers concerning these issues because they are so multifaceted, complicated, nuanced, and delicate. But so too is the work of abolishing coloniality, which is why I wanted to come here today and discuss this topic with you all. With this in mind, I wanted to pose the following questions for discussion and in, a, in an attempt to grapple with these issues in regards to social movements in the U.S. Southwest. So for now, I'll just pose these questions for you to think about 
um, when we get to the uh, discussion portion of this panel. Um, my first question is how should insurgent scholars go, go about the work of writing and publishing for and with social movements in the U.S. Southwest? My second question is what are the responsibilities of insurgent scholars in regards to translating critical theory for and with these movements? My third question is how should insurgent scholars translate social movements for academic audiences in order to advance projects of collaborative social change? And my last question is how can the academy be made a vital site for insurgent or activist philosophy in the US Southwest? And I look very forward to talking about these issues with you all and thank you so much for your time. Hello, my name is Carrie Chu and I'm a member of the Chickasaw Nation. I've been learning and researching my indigenous heritage language for about 10 years. So my degree is in language, reading, and culture from the University of Arizona College of Education. And my specialization is in language revitalization and linguistics. So my presentation today draws on my experiences as a scholar, educator, and language activist to explore research and writing protocols that reflect and respect my language and my cultural teachings. And so I'd like to begin by distinguishing between two key terms. So most likely you've heard the term language revitalization. And I use this term to talk about um, increasing the number of speakers of a language and also the domains where that language is used. So for example, the home or the school. Encompassing language revitalization is this notion of language reclamation. And language reclamation is what I want to talk about today. At its core, language reclamation is a social justice movement. Miami scholar Wesley Leonard says that it's one of reclaiming the cultural context and sense of value that a language would have had if not for colonization. So indigenous languages are and have always been vital. So in that way, the language is actually the secondary concern when we're doing this work. I like to say that we're not working to renew just our language, but our sense of humanity. And from there, the language will naturally follow. So because this conference is about writing for social justice, I pulled these headlines about indigenous languages from a few re recent news stories. And I'm wondering if you might call out some words that stand out to you here. Extinction. Extinction. Voices of the past. Yeah, past. <laughs> exactly. So fight, loss, danger, extinction. This idea that we need someone to save our languages. Endangered, failing, that this work is failing. Past, ancient, last. And so these words are part of a dominant narrative which is portraying our indigenous languages and also the people and the, the speakers and the communities who speak them as relics of the past, right? That don't have um, um, any relevance in our contemporary world. So importantly, in our indigenous communities, this is not how we talk about our languages. Indigenous counter stories hold that our languages do not go to extinct, but rather they go to sleep. So they are alive, they're vital, and in cases where they're not spoken anymore, they've gone to sleep, they're capable of being reawoken. So my own dissertation was a counter story and in our language, I called it Chukashinopa Ilanopa Homi Biikachi. We will always speak Chickasaw. And so this is a story of my great, 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 my great, 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 three greats, grandparents, forced removal from our homelands in the Southeast, around where Mississippi is today, to Indian territory, 
Does anyone know what we call Indian Territory now? Oklahoma, Oklahoma right? Does anyone know what Oklahoma means? It's a word in Chickasaw or Choctaw. It's actually two words, Oklahoma. It means red people. So that's where my um, ancestors were removed to. And so this story also includes an English-only boarding school era. So this picture includes my great-great-grandmother with her classmates. And her generation learned that she should speak English and that she should only speak English. And this is a story that includes years of enduring pressure to assimilate. This is my great-grandfather with his two sons. And I didn't know my great-grandfather, but I can assume that if he knew the language at all, he probably understood it, but he didn't speak it himself. And so his children grew up without the language, and so did every other generation um, next in my family. And so this is the point in the story where that dominant narrative ends, with the claim that Chukashinopa is severely endangered. We have 50 remaining fluent speakers who are all elders, their grandparents, great-grandparents. We have no children that are learning to speak Chukashinopa as a first language. And so, but I don't like that label, severely endangered, because what that label does is it only counts what's happening at those two ends of this life journey, and what about what happened in between. So this is what my dissertation was about, our second language learners. Today there are many ways that people can engage with our language. We have texts, we have apps, and we have software to learn Chickasaw. We have um, clubs and camps for kids and families, and we have emergent opportunities for adults. I chose this last picture here because it includes three generations. So this is, that's my mom on the left. She raised me to be proud of being Chickasaw, but she couldn't give me the language because she didn't have it herself. And so I'm the first person in my family to begin this journey of language reclamation. And I do that with a sense of purpose for these next generations, that they will grow up knowing their languages and that they will know who they are. Telling my community and my language's counter story required certain ethical considerations. Because this wasn't just a story about myself. I worked with other people who were like me, who were learning and speaking and teaching Chikashinopa. Altogether, I interviewed about 22 different people engaged in this work. And so the first step in my process was to think about how to ask in a Chickasaw way. Mm. And so, inspired by Maori scholar Linda Smith, one of our own Chickasaw scholars suggested this protocol that he calls Chikasha Asithla. This was Joshua Henson. So Chikasha Asithla means to ask Chickasaw. To ask in a way that's respectful, transparent, humble, reciprocal, and careful. And so this was central to my process of interviewing. White scholars have addressed the ethical protocols for asking. The topic of writing calls for further attention. Because as Linda Smith says, if we write without thinking critically, it can be dangerous. When I was first starting out as a student and a researcher, I felt very confused about how to find balance between the ethical protocols that I was hearing at the university and from what I was hearing in my community. And so on the one hand, Western research asks for subjects to be anonymous, for researchers to be objective, and for the benefit to be to yourself and to the academy. On the other hand, my community and other indigenous communities emphasize the humanity of our people, not our subjects, but of people. The researcher maintains humility, respect, reciprocal relationships, transparency, and care. And ultimately, that benefit is to the community. And so early on, I was working on a writing 
project. And the, comp the compromise that I came up with was that I would assign numbers to my participants, but I would translate them into Chickasaw. So instead of talking about Stan, I would talk about Chafa, which means one. Mm. And so using the language in this way was truly dangerous because I was essentially dehumanizing those who had shared their stories with me, and I was using the language to do so. I realized from that mistake that instead of trying to plug my language into a Western research framework, I needed to think about how my writing process as an indigenous person might actually reflect my language and my cultural teachings. So when I began my dissertation research, one of the first things that I did was got tribal IRB approval um, to give participants a choice about using their real names. And if they didn't want to use them, what pseudonym they would like to use. But really, that wasn't enough. So I began to think about what it meant to not just ask Chickasaw, but to write Chickasaw. And I call this Chikusha Holosochi. I liken this process to beadwork, which is a cultural art form that I practice. And as Ace Greenwood, who's a Chickasaw artist, said, beadwork is essentially a process of storytelling with your hands. When I learned to bead, I was taught two things. The first is that when you bead something for someone, you need to be thinking good thoughts about them. The second lesson that I learned early on was that when you bead, sometimes the beads break. And if you are beading and all of a sudden the beads just keep breaking, that that is the beads telling you that something's wrong. You're not having a good mind and you need to stop. So I thought about this when I was writing. There would be times when I would get what many refer to as writer's block. And I remember one time this happened, I had taken all my interviews and I put them into in vivo, which is the software that you can use to code interviews. So essentially you're taking chunks from each of the interviews and you're putting them under themes that you've identified. What happened was that I had dissected all of these words. And so I went to sit down to write it up and I couldn't write. So I had to reflect on that. Why couldn't I write? And what I realized when I took a moment was that the words were telling me that they didn't want to be told dissected. Mm. These were stories that were meant to be whole first. And so with a good mind, thinking good thoughts about each person as I wrote their story, I returned to writing and that process began to slow again. A final step in this process, and it's an important one, was giving people back their words. And so I shared the stories that I had written back with those participants. And this was not just about reciprocity, but also accountability. Participants appreciated the opportunity to see what I had written before I published it. One participant shared that she was so glad that I had approached the write-up of our interview as the telling of a story, and that she was so touched by it that she shared it with her children. One of our youth um, told the language program, I feel so happy that she took the time to do this for us. And so it was these enthusiastic responses that affirm the necessity of working from a culturally grounded research and writing methodology that's centered on respect for individuals, for their families, and for the community as a whole. So what are the implications of all of this? When carried out thoughtfully and carefully, and with time, writing becomes a powerful tool for indigenous people to recover our own stories about ourselves, and thereby resist those dominant narratives that betray our languages and our communities in terms of deficits. When writing reflects cultural teachings and values, it becomes a project 
that's bound to the recovery of our languages and epistemological foundations. And so for this reason, it's important that we have a good mind when we write, thinking good thoughts about individuals and communities who have trusted us with their stories. Yeah, okay. Thank you, Kate and Perry. We have approximately <coughs> 21 minutes for questions and discussion. Uh, who would like to start us off? Volunteers or victims? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I would like to make an observation while y'all are gathering your thoughts that, that connects both of y'all's decolonial scholarship. Uh, because within the decolonial work that both of y'all are doing, and if we attach that to the other work that's out there and the other ways, decolonial ways of being, is there's the, the interconnectedness of it all. Um, so I, I, that's the, the balance, the counterbalance to the extinction is the ecological niche that is there. Uh, so although there is the interconnectedness of it all, if I could be a little uh, literary, there's also the, the frailty of it all, which is uh, a sentence in Cormac McCarthy's The Road, uh, when he's reflecting on the precariousness of their whole situation. Um, it's one of his observations. Uh, not only does he have to protect his son, uh, but uh, he has this interconnectedness that acknowledges the frailty of it all. Mm -hmm. So I, hopefully that gets us started. Because uh, I have a lot more questions, but I don't want to bogart the discussion time. <laughs> I guess I have a question for each of you. Um, Kate, I love the, the optimism and the kind of utopian vision of um, abolitionism. Um, in imagining that you don't want to participate with any kind of reformist project because it's all messed up and we have to just begin with decolonization, period. I'm just curious what that looks like for you. So um, I've been trying out different methods on various organizing drives, like using various stuff that I'm working on as like test cases, you know. And mostly what has to happen is that you um, start off with your basic organizing group, you go through all the established policies and procedures, people get the smack down um, from those entities, and by that point, which is usually six months to a year out, people start to shift to thinking, what would it be like if we just refused to negotiate um, with these entities and started thinking about new ways to orient to the world? So part of it is actually like walking with people through that journey, you know, and not refusing to work with people who want the reformist approach, you know, that would be impossible to my long-term goal, right, to a long-term goal of abolition. But it's more to start speaking it into existence so that people start to think it's possible. And um, it's amazing what happens when people keep running up against power over and over again and it keeps consuming them and rejecting them and throwing them out of the rooms where the decisions are being made. Um, people actually come to this uh, decolonial option or the abolition option pretty much on their own after having gone through this process. So I see part of my job as like an organizer and an insurgent scholar is to like get people there. Um, and then as far as the long-term goals of this go, you know, that's something I, I haven't really worked out and that no one's really working out. You know, that's the whole um, project of it all is like, how would you get this off the ground? How would it be sustainable? You know, and so all you can do is just kind of put into your mix, like your imagination of what that looks like in conversation with other scholars, you know, that are working on it. But um, most of this stuff is definitely, you know, coming from the convergence of people reviewing and interacting with subjugated knowledges and ways of orienting with the world. One of those being about rethinking how, how, how life is understood and, and conceived, you know? Um, but that's, so that's, these are things I've been trying out in my own organizing, um, but you don't just start off with a group of people who are ready to enact a, um, abolition. Mostly that comes after you've walked through the process. 
And can I follow up with a question for, for Carrie? I, it is such a sweet interaction between the two papers. Yours just seemed very macro, Kate and Carrie. I loved the, the, the way it seemed like it was a process of decolonization and practice. But given that you too are in an institution and working in these kind of subjugated spaces, I was curious, just for example, how your work with the Human Subjects Board at the U of A interacted with your work with the Human Subjects Board of, in, the, in the tribal sense. So like, did you find that there was a conflict between the two? And um, is, is the way that, you, that your, your role in this institution interferes with, or like, how, how, how do you negotiate the, the space between the expectations of those two um, bodies, institutional right. bodies, cultures? Right, and it's, it's different at different universities. So when I share that example of um, having to keep my subjects anonymous, that was when I was working on my master's thesis, which was at UCLA. And at that time, um, that was probably 2011, 2010, our tribe's IRB has been, um, it's been established for a while, but it's run out of our hospital. So it was very geared towards biomedical. Um, so they weren't really doing a lot of approval of the qualitative research. So when I went through UCLA, I had to get the university IRB approval to work, to do interviews with people. And then I just wrote a letter to our governor, you know, that this is what I'm doing. And that was sort of how that worked. But the the problem was that the university wanted people to remain anonymous, you know, keep, people can't be tied to their names. And what happened was people read my thesis and they're like, well, we know who everybody is. So you can just tell, right? There's only so many people that are doing this work and I interviewed all of them. So um, when I got to U of A, our tribal IRB had developed a little bit more. So it was possible to go through the Chickasaw Nation IRB for approval. And so essentially, U of A deferred to the tribal IRB. So I had to fill out a little bit of paperwork for them, but ultimately it was the tribal IRB that oversaw that research. And there was a lot more flexibility in terms of allowing people to use their names and what, you know, thinking through some of these questions about what the community really needs from this research. Although they would not let me allow youth in my study to use their real names. And that was a problem because um, one of the youth, for example, the one who said, I'm so happy that she did this for us, she also said, why are you calling me this other name that's not my name? And working with the IRB, I eventually got approval that I could use her name, but that process took a year. So by the time I went back to her and, and said, you know, do you want me to change your name in this? She wasn't interested in it. You know, like we had moved on from that, a year had passed. It wasn't on her mind anymore, so it is hard navigating, you know, those sort of like ethical procedures through the IRBs. Um, it's hard to get that immediate response, like why can't we let this youth attach her name to her story and she has a very valid point that she wants that to happen. in ways that, say, are no longer colonial, 
but are not simply about the abolition or the eradication of the institution. And then, you know, kind of for you as well, is there, um, does it work? Is there a sort of abolitionist moment? Is there a way that, uh, you know, uh, we finally need to do away with sort of uh, certain aspects of university uh, kind of institutional power, authority, culture, even in, work, in order for the kind of recuperative work that you want to do. Uh, so even though you're in the institution, you're trying to do recuperative kind of work with the Chickasaw language, you actually would have to abolish something in order to be able to fully realize what you're trying to do. I don't know if that's a fair way of trying to connect or create a sort of a draw out attention. But I'm curious what your response is. So, are you asking me? Is can you like rephrase your question? Is it is it about like is there something that you recuperate along the way to the goal of reaching um, abolition, or well, I think I got a little lost. There's a tension. So okay, I mean there's a tension between you know abolition usually sort of implies that that the sort of the end game is the uh, the doing away with a certain kind of institutional power that we could call colonial, we could call it capitalist, you know, an earlier version of the kind of conflict you're talking about would have been maybe kind of like socialist politics in the 19th century, where there were similar kind of, you know, disagreements between revolutionary and reformist movements. Totally. And reformist movements would say, <laughs> hey, people are suffering now, we need to change these institutions in order to make life better for people right the immediate, now, right totally. here. Mm -hmm. And then the revolutionary movements would say, if you do that, you're making people think that capitalism is tolerable and you're trying to prop up a system that is fund fundamentally exploitative. Let's try to bring it down, mm -hmm. right? And so my question is, is there something on the reformist sort of agenda, this way of sort of trying to imagine the need uh, the need for certain, you know, kind of reconfiguring of institutions in order to make life livable. Right. Important yes. to, to your project. Yes, and in my work, I call those kind of, so I, I talk about those strategies. So basically, in my writing and, and how I'm thinking about this, I promote abolition as a necessarily compassionate, generous practice, you know, where you're not going around and telling people that they're selling out because they're putting food on the table to keep their families alive. Like, that's not my goal. But I do call reformist strategies in my work counterinsurgent survival strategies because I do want to highlight like how those kind of strategies keep this power con consistently vital and um, they rearticulate it. So I do call those counterinsurgent survival strategies. But to call out that like if your long-term goal is to maybe orient towards the wor world in a new way, then this is something that's going to meet your short-term needs. But then in the long term, you know, you're still facing these other issues. So that's why I separate those out. But I would never tell people, you know, not to go for those things that are going to increase their chances of a, you know, healthy life and survival on this planet. I'm just saying that, like, that's the short-term solution, but in the long term, your children's children might not have water, for example. So if that's your frame of reference, like, you know, wouldn't you want to start working towards something different now? Um, but that's the thing about abolition work is this is a long-term plan, right? So you just start, like I said, by speaking it into existence and then kind of thinking about how to achieve it, you know? And I think your work is so helpful because you are, um, you know, like how you manipulated and worked with the IRBs in order to, um, you know, do what was best for your for the folks that you're working with actually changed how they were conceived, right? Because at this point, they're no longer research subjects, you know. They are actually people that you're working with to help improve their lives. And that is was an abolitionary moment, right? Because it actually changed how those folks were conceived of by the IRB. So, yeah. I'm going to be honest, but I don't know quite how to answer your question. I'm still thinking about it a little bit, but... Um, one thing I will say is that, you know, the university is, is not a space that can give us these things that we're looking for as Native people. When we go there, it's often to take back because the university is extracted. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times our languages are there in the archives, um, you know, our cultural items are in museums. So when we go there, we're going there to kind of get those back. Um, 
when I went to grad school at UCLA, I only applied to one school, and that's because that's where the linguist was that worked on Chickasaw, and she's not Chickasaw. Um, and I thought, if I don't get in here, then this is really what I want to be doing. So I went there. I learned from her you know, how she thought about our language. But ultimately, I had to take that back and put it back in the community. So because in the book, you know, she, she'll have example sentences like, the chief ate the boy. You know, that illustrates a grammatical concept, but it doesn't have anything to do with our culture or how we would speak our language. So it's this process of taking it back from the university, reclaiming it, and bringing it and putting it back in that cultural context where we can create tools that are actually useful for us, immersion lessons that are in the language um, for our kids and things like that. So um, it's really complicated. That's my answer to that question. <laughs> Thanks. I mean, going back to that question, the, the relationship between the papers, I mean, in some ways it's about abolitionism uh, and just opposed to a type of recuperation, but that recuperation is built on a type of, like, cultural and tribal sovereignty. Yeah. Um, and then, if that's the case, then we have to start asking, what's the relationship between sovereignty and abolitionism? Um, and I don't have an answer on that. I just, that's what I'm hearing um, from the three speakers. Or even to a, 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 a abolition to autonomy, especially, because one of the other chief concepts that I see that interconnects both of y'all's work is the selflessness. Mm -hmm. There's a selfless aspect to it. Um, I think both of you highlighted that in, in your own ways. Uh, we've got time for one, maybe two questions. Um, I was thinking about the term epistemic disobedience, and it, it sounds like, as your term gave it, it sounds like you're doing some of the RD process. Um, and I'm also thinking of, I think, John Lewis talks about getting in good trouble. Mm -hmm. um, so if, if you want to give us, I, I think there are some graduate students here, but I guess this applies to professors as well. Um, how, how do you get into good trouble uh, as a graduate student in the university or as a professor? And, and what, what does it look like? like how, how do you engage with that? And, and how do you know that you're in the good kinds of trouble? I don't, I don't know. I mean, that's a great question. I mean. Um, I know for my part, I just have always tried to get in on the organizing that was presenting itself to me, like just trusting that I was supposed to be working on these particular projects, you know? Um, but for me, the good trouble is when the people in power are mad at you. So, you know, and that I personally um, think that conflict is a very good, powerful, generative thing. And um, I'm, I've always enjoyed it, you know? And so whenever I'm in like a, that kind of situation where I'm butting up um, against you know, power and its fortifications, that to me is good trouble. But for other people I organize with, they don't want to do that, you know what I mean? Um, they want to stay under the radar. They don't want to butt up against that kind of trouble. They want to come in after maybe we've pushed that power down a little bit. And that's fine too, that's good trouble for them. And so I really think a lot of the stuff is negotiated through the organizing, you know? Um, and, but I mean, like I said, I think that a lot of times like conflict is, is the good trouble for me, but I don't know. For you? Yeah, I think I think a lot of times I stumble into it without knowing, and then when I when people react, that's when I realize that that situation exists. So recently, I went into a university anthropology building, and the chair of the department told me that essentially that my presence there made him feel uh, guilty. They had human, you know, human remains in their basement, and we're doing, you know, continued excavation work, and so yeah, still. Um, and so I think a lot of times as a native person, just <laughs> walking through the university, that's where I'm finding myself, without even realizing that I was um, causing someone to kind of check their privilege and you know their what their work was really doing to indigenous communities. We got time for one more, huh? I'm gonna have to use that, by the way. I'm gonna incorporate that into my repertoire. Huh? Get, get into some good trouble. Huh? <laughs> and um, epistemic disobedience isn't my term. It's um, Walter Mignolo. You should check him out. He has a whole article about it, and it actually gives more suggestions for how to go about this than I did today. The darker side of modernity. Huh? It's got a little Pink Floyd. Uh, 
ishness to it too. For the insurgent right. scholar. Yeah. <laughs> for, for the bricks in the wall. <laughs> Well, I, I want to thank our, our panelists again, and I want to thank you all for being here and participating. And uh, for those of you who are going to be in Tucson tomorrow, uh, safe travels, and uh, we'll see you there. Uh, please, thank you.